morning, afternoon. I'm Naya Swami Asha, and my guest today is Keshava. Again, it's Monday. We've been doing um, our third generation of new Ananda leaders talking to each of them sequentially, the Palo Alto group. So it's Monday, so we're talking to Keshava today. So far, we've talked to Keshava about how he became a disciple about his interest in astrology, about the millennial, the influence on millennials of virtual reality. And today I want to ask Keshava about the practice of chanting because I know it's something that you're um, very devoted to and uh, gifted in. So I'm going to start out by just asking you to define what is chanting. Hmm. I think chanting is a devotional prayer or mantra set to music, uh, because the music helps to invoke deeper and deeper feeling, as well as keeps the mind from slipping into sort of unconsciousness through repetition. Music can be repeated more and more with deeper and deeper feeling more easily, I think. So to me, chanting is just prayer with a little help. <laughs> uh, it's famously quoted often that Paramahansa Yogananda said, and this is how he put it, chanting is half the battle. Yeah. So what battle, what half, and why did he say that? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I love that quote. It's been one of my staples um, in my own practice and also when I teach. Um, but it seems to me that the battle he's referring to is the battle of raising energy up the spine. And this is uh, the gospel according to Keshava now, but I was really thinking about that quote of his because it seems to have so much impact to think of the battle of life, of reuniting our energy with God. And if chanting is half of it, why and how is that so impactful? And I was sort of chewing on this idea. And then it just came to me this thought that the heart chakra is of course halfway up the spine. And chanting helps lift and magnetize all of our energy to the heart. And then I'm sort of paraphrasing now, but I thought I remember Swamiji saying that the heart is a pivotal chakra because when your energy is in the heart, it can either go up to God or it can go down in emotions and desires. But just getting the energy to the heart is halfway up the spine. And when it's chanting, then when you magnetize the heart, it's almost the natural extension to offer it up to Divine Mother or to God in whatever form you hold dear. Now, wouldn't that be true for any music? What makes chanting different? Then? I think what makes chanting different is the, the focus point, that it's not, it's not beauty in a limited human definition. I have played beautiful classical music for years and have even felt some inspiration and some upliftment in my spirit from doing it, but it has never touched me or transformed me as powerfully as chanting does. And okay. yeah. No, go ahead and you finish your thought. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think it's because chanting or music carries more than just feeling, it carries consciousness. And this goes into what you and Tandava were talking about, art and consciousness and those sorts of things. But one thing that constantly thrills my heart is that Yogananda said he spiritualized every one of his chants and that if we chant it with sincerity, that we will be pulled into that sphere of magnetism, which is such an incredible promise. Now, how, how could that work? I mean, he, what does it mean to say he spiritualized it? I mean, we're talking just for the people who don't know it. The body of chants, mostly, that we do in Ananda were either written by Swami Kriyananda or by Paramahansa Yogananda, by Master. Some of them are traditional, and a few of them were written by other devotees. So yeah. Master said he spiritualized the chants that he wrote. So tell me, what, what does that mean? That sounds great, but what does it mean? Yeah, it sounds great. <laughs> Not only does it sound great, it feels great. But what I think he means, and I'm, again, I'm paraphrasing because it's been a while since I've read some of his writings on this. But I think he said he took every one of those chants and he chanted them with so much sincerity and with so much spiritual focus and power until he broke through the barrier 
of consciousness and experienced God in a particular form, in a particular vibration, which then I sort of like imagine that as penetrating through the veil of delusion and suddenly that chant has now been flooded with that vibration of God. And so every note, every word, every moment of that chant now is like impregnated with that power to guide you back through that same portal that Yogananda opened. So, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying and I'm a devotee also, but that sounds almost like wizardry or like, um, Bibbidi bobbidi boo, you know, like the the god, the fairy godmother in Cinderella, you know, just making something happen. It sounds like magic. It is, is it, magic. <laughs> is it magic. What's I mean? Uh, what's the difference between magic and mysticism, or you know? Well, I suppose uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but what I can say, perhaps, is the difference is that mysticism is experienceable by you. Mm -hmm. And so I read Master make that statement, and I immediately thought, cool, not, yeah. no, but not, ju not just cool, like nifty, cool magic trick, but uh -huh. I want that. And so I started taking chants, and I would just go after them, hammer and nail for months. I would mm -hmm. chant. There was one period of my life where I listened to, chanted, mentally out loud all the time desire my great enemy i would chant it for 30 minutes or an hour straight almost mm -hmm. every day i would listen to it anytime i was in the car anytime i was walking i would be humming it i would recite it and i just tried to totally engross myself in the vibration of that chant hoping that it would sort of reveal to me that mystic door into the experience that Yogananda promised, which interestingly for that chant, he said that the, the experience of super consciousness we achieve through that chant is being completely free from material desires. Mm -hmm. Wow. Are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Are you better than you were when you started? I am better. And what, what has been so inspiring to me is to feel glimmers of that freedom. That I, I think that's one of the soul-stirring things I love so much about mysticism is it's not absolute. It's a gradient. And that it's experienceable, the, the greatest experience of God is tasteable on a smaller uh, vibration as well. And so I would chant that chant with great sincerity until I felt that the first half was me, the devotee, crying out to God, what will be my fate? Oh, Lord, tell me. And then God responds. And I would chant that until I could feel my guru's voice in the sound of my own voice calling back to me, pranayam be thy religion, pranayam will give thee salvation. And then the final line, you won't have to fear anything anymore. And when I started really feeling that that was my guru's promise to me, and not some intellectual idea, but that he was literally telling me that through the vibration of this chant, through the vibration of my own voice, then I could feel my heart just expand and rise. And it was some of the most dynamic experiences of an expanded freedom of the heart I've ever had. And I remember I was walking in Larchmont Village in, in Los Angeles, which is like a material hub of, <laughs> of LA. Everything there is expensive and perfect and pretty and everybody's put together and they're chasing the material desires with so much um, efficiency that they're gaining them. And I was walking down the streets and just tears were pouring down my face because I could, I realized that my happiness was completely independent of all those things. And that all I wanted was night and day in thy joy, oh my Lord. And so, no, did I completely dissolve all of my desires in God? Perhaps not, but I tasted a moment of that. And it's made me so hungry for that ever since. I think your answer has demonstrated my, my, the answer to my question. Like magic is something that is done for you. 
but mysticism is something you have to do for yourself. So the missing ingredient is master can uh, light the path, but you have to walk it. Yeah. And, and so ma magic is passive. And to fulfill the promise of the chance, you have to be active in it. And so how, how much, it's, it's actually what it is. It's as many as received him, to them gave he the power. That's how exactly it. Yeah. yeah, that's it. And what you described was the process of really how to receive it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then so, what, what's incredible is Master promises that after you, and he encourages you to spiritualize a chant through repetition until you penetrate the veil and, and drink from that vibration of God's consciousness. And then his promise is, and forevermore. Whenever you chant that chant, you will more quickly arrive at that state of consciousness. And I can attest to that, that after really going deeply into a chant, or as deep as I did, coming back to that experience is much faster now. Whenever I pick it up, it just draws me back to that sphere. Well, Swami Kriyananda did not make those kinds of promises, didn't articulate it the way Yogananda did. But he says about all the music that he has, everything, songs and chants, that he received them and that they were a, a, a new kind of consciousness in music, is how he put it, expressed as music. So has your experience of some of Swami Kriyananda's chants been the same or is it just Master's chants? No, Swami's chants, absolutely. And also Swamiji's music. Swami wrote a few um, antidotes that he said you could use some of his songs as antidotes for negative uh, emotional tendencies or qualities. And basically I took that as a roadmap to see, if, and he, I mean, he wrote some really beautiful things with it, but like, for example, um, let's see if I can pull one out of my hat here. Um, uh, he said to overcome the fear of death, uh, to sing, I live without fear. Mm -hmm. And I love that song, and I've sung it many times, and I've developed a great uh, love of its vibration. But actually, there was another one that's more closely united to my own experience. I went through a phase when I was just eaten alive by criticism of other people, and I, I just did not like how that affected my consciousness. And so I looked at Swami's antidotes, and he said the song, Have You Seen Sorrento? was the antidote for criticism. Mm -hmm. And so I started singing that song, Hammer and Nails, anytime mm -hmm. I could. I'd listen to it, I'd sing it, I rehearsed it, I practiced it, I performed it. And mm -hmm. I found that he was right. When I sang that song, I couldn't be in a critical mood because the song's all about this awe and this incredible gratitude for all the wonders of God. And it, it's just, it's completely the opposite vibration of criticism and like the carping spirit. And so when I sang that, it would draw me into that consciousness of gratitude and of wonderment and of appreciation. So I, I think it's absolutely one and the same. The only limitation is perhaps I haven't sung Swami's music like to the same volume as I have one chant of masters, for example. Well, um, but the the experience of chanting is different than the experience of the songs, isn't it? Don't you think so? Do you feel do you feel different, or is it really just one and the same? How how would you say that? I think the chanting, uh, chanting feels very very personal. That for me, whenever I chant, I try to get to the place where I sincerely feel that the chant is just the expression of my heart to God. And I don't mean that in, a, in an abstract way. I mean, I literally try to get to the place where I feel that God is hearing me and that I am sincerely calling out with those words, with those notes. And when I'm singing some of Swamiji's songs, because they're in a slightly different context, it maybe isn't so personal or so intimate, but I think we can still get into their consciousness with the same degree of attunement and surrender. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that you've been playing the cello since you were a child and your family is musical. Your parents, I know, are somewhat musical. How did you ever get started in chant? Well, I think it just started. I, I'm actually, it's a sweet story. 
chanting has literally always been a part of my life. My dad loves chanting and is very devotional. Um, he's, I really love listening to him chant because he, he never makes a show of it, but almost every morning in his room alone, he starts chanting and I, uh, he never displays his devotion. He never invites anybody to join him. He just chants because he loves God. And when I was a boy, he would chant and I would listen. But one thing that was particularly sweet was to put us to bed every night, he would chant to us. And the goal was that he would chant and it would help us relax and we'd fall asleep. But I loved the chanting so much, I'd stay awake. <laughs> <laughs> and I would wait for him to stop and sneak out of the room and then I'd go okay now I'll go to sleep <laughs> because I loved the chanting so how old were you I mean is that literally like you have an old older well you have two older brothers but so you like were you one were you just like a little baby in your crib yeah I think I was literally I don't have memories that far back my earliest I think are about well I don't Anyway, that's a different story. It's as far back as I can remember. And I wouldn't be surprised if he was doing it when I was one year old in a crib. Um, it was just, that was always the family routine for many, many years. Was it, did, did, did you ever talk to him about it or was it just the way things were? It was just the way things were. And then as I grew older and as I learned to love chanting, then him and I actually connected more on it. And now every time I go home, I always make a point to chant with him and he with me. Uh, which is very sweet because it's like a way for our mutual devotion and love for God to come together. Um, so I'm sure you're conscious of what an extraordinary blessing that was. It really was. Yeah. I, I, it really, I think it helped a mystic karma in me to blossom at a very young age. And I am so grateful because I think that really set the stage for me to develop in the way that I have. Just as a, as a story to illustrate what I mean by this, I remember being, I couldn't have been more than four years old. And I remember lying outside on our trampoline, gazing up at the blue sky and chanting, my Krishna is blue. And I had no idea what a tamal tree is, but I knew that when I die, I wanted to go where Krishna was. And that it wasn't pretentious for me to be chanting that. It was such a sincere prayer demand at that, even at that age. I didn't even really know what I was saying, but I remember the sincerity of my heart when I was chanting that. Isn't it interesting? You know, that's Master talks about in Autobiography of the Yogi, Master says, prayerful surges arose within me in many languages. Mm -hmm. He was he speaks of being frustrated by not really being able to express what he was feeling. Now, just to be fun with this, but you didn't, your path from four years old to where you're sitting right now wasn't a straight line. Nope. <laughs> so what happened to chanting in the middle? <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried really hard to convince myself that I was other than I was. Uh -huh. um, and I, I tried to cover my mystic, heart from myself for a number of years in an attempt to be popular and to be accepted but what's interesting is actually music was always the way that divine mother just came and laughed at me like okay. oh you can try but you cannot run from yourself <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know if i shared this before but one of my deepest spiritual experiences when i was that when i was about 12 years old came from singing Swamiji's oratorio. And uh, we, I was singing at the time, I think I was just, my voice was just maturing where I was starting to sing the tenor parts. And I sang with the Ananda Village Choir. My mom drug me there and I would always go kicking and screaming. And then at the end of the choir, I'd always get in the car and I'd say, wow, that was so inspiring. I'm so grateful I came. <laughs> and so she'd always drag me there week after week. And then this one week I was there and we sang the song Living Water. And the, the triumph of that piece comes with the lyrics, he can redeem you from any evil. And there I was, I was 12 years old and I didn't have like a great concept of all of my evil from past incarnations, nor had I done so many terrible things in my life to be overcome with guilt. But when I sang that, for some reason, I felt 
Christ's promise. And it just broke my heart open. And I, I literally had to sit down and I wept in that rehearsal for 15 minutes. And it was undeniable to my heart that, that I was receptive to that. But then the next day I went back to school and my friends asked me, how was my day yesterday? And I didn't know how to, I didn't have the courage to tell them that. And, and so out of fear and out of a desire to be accepted, I just kind of put that away. And I went back to trying to be a cool and hip teenager. And then basically that, that inner desire, that yearning for a mystic experience developed and grew and grew and grew until it just exploded and yanked me back to where I belonged, I guess. When did you come back? <clears throat> when you came back to the spiritual path, did you come back to chanting or had you ever stopped? Um, I had stopped. I mean, I wasn't chanting in my own personal life for like 12 to 16. But then when I was 16 and I came back to the path and I started meditating again, and then I became a disciple and a Kriyaban, then I did start chanting a lot. Um, it was actually really great. I got thrown right into the mix above my head when I was 16 and I moved to Los Angeles into the ashram. They asked me to start leading morning meditations. And I was like, Lean, I mean, okay, I, I can barely meditate for an hour and a half, but I'll give it my shot. And um, so I had to learn how to chant because I was going to lead meditations. And so I learned uh, Sri Ram, Jai Ram, and Blue uh, engrosses the bee of my mind on the blue lotus feet of my divine mother. And I basically just alternated those two chants for the first six months and then slowly built out my repertoire from there. And then um, actually, it was interesting at that time, I didn't have the awareness of how powerful and important of a tool it was for me. It took me years to figure that out. And how did it come to you that it was? Did you, did you make a mental decision to test it or did it creep up on you from the inside? It was, a, it was a mental decision to really test it out. It came when I was energizing six times a day. And I just kind of got on this mental kick. In and of itself, which is in and of itself notable. But anyway, so we're energizing six times a day. At okay. least. Or maybe one more. or two. Yeah. Okay, six times a day we're energizing. And yeah. And I, I, I just got bit by a bug, which is that, like you said, I wanted to know, is this magic or is this mysticism? And mm -hmm. I, if, the, if the bridge between no experience and deep experience was merely my willingness and my application, then I figured, now's the time. Let's see if this really works. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I was energizing so much, is I wanted to prove to myself without a shadow of a doubt that it worked. And it does. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, I was sort of on that kick. And that's when I read what Master said about that this chant can draw you into an experience of God. And I said, let's find out. Yeah. Um, do you, at this point in your life, do you have favorite chants? I do. They sort of alternate. And I don't mean to sound too much like a mercenary, but they, because there's, there could be two ways for me to pick my favorites, like my favorite melodies, and then my favorite um, promises that the chants offer. And so there are a few chants that I absolutely adore, their music and their poetry and what they are. But then there are a few of my chants that I'm really going after right now because I want what they promise. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like for example, Master's chant, Thousands of Suns and Moons, he says, we'll draw you to the experience of wisdom. Yeah. And I want that. Thousands <laughs> of suns and moons from thy body do shine. Yeah. What's the rest of the words? Who tells me thou art dark, O oh, my mother divine? Thousands of suns and moons from thy body do shine. And it's so, so beautiful to me because it seems like maybe it's sort of hinting at the fact that once you experience truth, no one can tell you otherwise. Mm -hmm. Very good. And so what's an example of one where it's more the melody and the poetry rather than the promise? Um, let's see. I really love the melody of Search Him Out in Secret Now. Uh -huh. Can you, uh, we, you should give it just a little tiny bit of it because not everyone knows it in their minds when you say that. 
Without meditation, mind, hither, thither, wondrous thou. Without meditation, mind, hither, thither, wondrous thou. Adorable thing. Adorable thing. Search him out in secret now. Search him out in secret now. And the promise of that chant is actually quite stunning, too. That master said that's the chant that will draw you into an inner experience of the subtle anatomy, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So, but the melody of that is really haunting. Yeah, and it's a, it's more complex than listen, listen, listen to my heart song or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Do you think the ability to sing well is part of being able to chant well? Um, yes and no. Mm -hmm. What is this is something that I've kind of thought about because, of course, I always tell people you don't have to be a singer to chant because you don't. It's not about the quality that you produce. It's about the sincerity of your heart. But at the same time, I like to think of God as like my divine lover. Mm -hmm. or, and so if I was trying to woo my divine lover to come to me, wouldn't I sing sweetly? Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's a way for me to express my devotion by trying to sing sweetly, by trying to sing well. You don't have to. But for me, it actually helps deepen the experience because it's my way of demonstrating my level of care. Mm -hmm. You know, I, being a mediocre singer rather than a really good one myself, um, I do find that when I can forget about whether I'm doing it well and just make it a conversation where, you know, see so much about loving is the belief that your love is wanted. Yeah. And so if you sing well, you can believe that God enjoys listening to you. If you sing in a mediocre or a bad fashion, the only reason he wants to listen is because he loves you. <laughs> that's so <laughs> sweet. That's so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And that's another way to sort of, you need to be able to sing well enough to forget yourself. Yeah. And it's also, it's, 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 it's making it uh, not a performance. Yeah. Yeah. And that's definitely, that's the goal. And mm -hmm. for me, just because I do sing and because I do practice vocal technique outside of chanting, I'm just trying to use that as a springboard into that forgetfulness. But you're absolutely right. You know, Swamiji said one of the reasons that he, he has such a nice singing voice, he believed, is because in previous incarnations he spent hours chanting to God. Yeah. And that which was used for a divine purpose was blessed in that sense. So if you only had one technique, would it be chanting or energization? Chanting. Chanting. Yeah. God. That's a, ooh, well, that's a tough call. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's a really tough call. It's a trick question. There's no right answer. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, that's interesting to contemplate. I'd say chanting because um, when you love, then there's no need for anything else. Uh -huh. But um, on the other hand, so my heart said chanting, but my mind was questioning energization because master said it was the desert island technique. <laughs> right, if you're alone on a desert island and you only have one. But, but his answer was, you would discover all the rest of the techniques. If you knew energization, it would lead you to everything else. Right. But I think that chanting is when Krishna told Radha to practice yoga, and she said, I can't take my mind away from you long enough, Lord, to practice any of the techniques. Yeah. Ah, he said, I don't think you need them. Yeah, that's so, so sweet. Yeah. Well, I know that, you know, Ananda Palal does lots of kirtans, you and others, Sai Ganesh and Tandava and Lakshmi, all of you lead the chanting. And so there's many opportunities for people to experience what you've talked about. And I suppose you would encourage them to try, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Try it in a group setting, like you said, in a kirtan, um, because then the combined magnetism can hopefully help everybody to go deeper. But just like meditation, the most profound experiences of chanting I've ever had were by myself. It was just me and God. 
Um, and so I would say more than anything, just start chanting at home. You don't even need to play a harmonium. You can just sing to God. And the melodies will still work their magic on your heart. Or not their magic, but their mystical effect. Okay. Very good. <laughs> All right, my friend. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Thank Keep you, us. Asha.